first, let's see if we have similar roots with a show of hands. Raise your hand if you went to university, got out, started a business, or applied for a job. Now, raise your hand if you entered a radio contest with a postcard, and that's what launched your career. That would be me. <laughs> Nobody wanted to put a 16-year-old kid on the radio, and so I had to find a way. I was desperate to find a way to get on the radio. You have to have a tape to get a job. You have to have a job to get a tape. There had to be a way, and the contest was the way. Of course, I had to get chosen. I won the contest, and I got the tape. That's the actual tape, and it's terrible. But I took it in the next day, and I applied for a job. They let me hang out there, and I got the work at the radio station. Now I'm thinking anything is possible. It all started actually a couple years before that with an old clock radio at the tip of the United States in the Pacific Northwest, where I was a kid in a lumberjack town with a window to the world being that clock radio, and I was listening to that radio and tuning through it. I realized years later I wasn't listening to it. I was listening through it. I was picking up on the formatics. I was becoming fascinated. I was becoming an armchair expert at broadcasting. And that, combined with that early start at the radio station, sent me to the biggest radio station in America, the world-famous K-Rock, where we did very, very counterintuitive things, like putting two talk shows on a radio station known for music. One, Love Line, was on one night a week. We put it on five nights a week because we needed to lead into a morning show that we just put together with two people who'd never done a morning show before. Imagine the pressure. We thought if we had a successful talk show at night, this was a love and relationship show, then we would in turn have people falling asleep with the radio on and they would wake up and they would listen to our new morning show. And it worked. That show lasted 30 years and I just inducted them into the Radio Hall of Fame last month in New York City. Most successful show of all time in Southern California. Love Line, the previous show, lasted 25 years. Success at K-Rock sent me to New York and MTV, where the novelty of music videos had worn off. They were looking for new inspiration and ways to make videos interesting again. There, luckily, timing-wise, there were two new genres of music coming out alternative music, and hip-hop. So imagine me with the chronic from Dr. Dre under one arm and Nirvana's Nevermind under the other, rolling into MTV, being able to package hip-hop and rap music, which was considered to be very controversial for advertisers. We quietly rebranded it MTV Jams, and it worked. Nobody complained, and it was very successful. And then TRL, which became the soapbox for every afternoon around the world for bands and artists to come and share their wares. And of course, those two guys, Beavis and Butthead, animated series talking about music videos. Again. There I am with Sean Diddy Combs at MTV headquarters in 1997, back when he was known as Puff Daddy. What's interesting is part of the strategy at MTV when I was there was to put more non-music programming on. We met up a couple of years ago in LA and said, there's no music on TV anymore, let's take it back. And we launched our own network, which is today the most successful independent music channel in the United States and growing around the world. So that was a pretty good trick. Kill the music on MTV and then bring it back on our own network later. <laughs> it doesn't always happen that way. So I wanted to tell you what really guides my journey. It's really a constant interest in moving pop culture and making things cool. Here's what I like to focus on. Taking chances on talent, leaning into big ideas, staying away from anything that doesn't have honesty and credibility. Build brands that people want to make part of their lives every day. So they're really tangible parts of their lives. And most importantly, first rule of show business, do not give people what they want. That's a utility. That's search. That's not what I'm about. I'm about giving people something I think they'll like based on what we know about them. That is the magic of show business. Surprise and delight your audience. I love when someone says, when I'm building a new company, are they crazy or do they know something that we don't? I don't care, I'll take either one of them. That's success in my book. So what now? Listening's broken. There are 800,000 podcasts out there and millions of other things to listen to. Problem is, listening's very different than watching. And all audio apps are built like Netflix. The behavior is very different. And also, the form factor of a podcast is very long. Imagine if every song was an hour long or 40 minutes long, and that would absolutely not work for playlists. It would absolutely not work for the discovery process. You look at music artists do not have the friction that podcasters have in connecting with an audience. That's what we set out to solve in my new company. How can we take away that friction and give someone the same experience that they have in listening to music through radio or through playlisting? And that is because search is podcasting's enemy. Speaker, in our minds, is the solution. It takes excerpts of podcasts and puts them into channels that forces them into your ears, into your AirPods. It plays. If you ask any other podcast app or platform to turn you on to something cool, you'll be greeted with silence. 
But at speaker, you'll be greeted with an always-on list of things that's playing and pushing interesting content out to you so you can discover things while you're listening. You don't have to discover them while you're looking at the app. There's where you find it in the App Store, and here's what it sounds like. It's Thursday on Speaker Live. And now, the news. Trump cast from Slate. Post reports by The Washington Post. From the newsroom of The Washington Post. It's Robert Samuels from The Washington Post. Post, this is Sarah Kaplan. Hi, this is Elahe Azadi with The Washington Post. Hey, how are This is Post Reports. I'm Martine Powers. Escape at the MCC, and I asked him if it was a walk away. And he said, no, we had two inmates go down the side of the building. And I said, eh, there's no way. Something dangling 17 stories out of Joseph Banks and Ken Connolly. My speaker is speaker powered by you. The stuff we know you already love and shows we're recommending for you. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Armchair Expert. Now I'm going to share a clip too, which is important because you don't have to share a whole podcast, you can share a clip. So imagine something that is easy to listen to like radio, but actually has the familiar functionality of, say, Instagram, but for audio. Swipe it, save it for later, build a virtual listening bookshelf for later when you've got more time. That's what Speaker is all about. You can find it at spkr.com. You'll get a direct link right there. Already one of the apps we love at Apple, which is exciting. That's essentially what the business is about. I'd love for you to have a chance to try it and check it out. And let's stay in touch. Email me or, you know, whatever else. And I look forward to getting together with Lars tonight from Metallica, because I have to tell you, Lars and Metallica and my time at MTV were ratings gold. I have to tell you, anything Metallica would just drive the ratings. I want to thank you for your time, and we'll see you later tonight. I was the generation of Video Killed the Radio Star, uh -huh. so I was about yeah. 10 years before you. MTV had such a huge impact, whether it was 80s, 90s, and so forth. My question is, what do you think your role is in your industry to address some of these big problems we're talking about today? I appreciate you want to bring sure. big ideas. Yeah, I have sort of been special ops in my industry over the years. People mm -hmm. reach out for me to solve problems with big ideas. Right. And I think that you know, harnessing a platform of scale to use it for good, as well as entertainment, is important. I think every great entertainment brand should have entertainment and you know utility as sure. part of it as well. We have such an impact on pop culture. That's right. If you can start moving that needle there, then perhaps these... Yeah, I have to tell you, I don't think people take it with enough responsibility. Mm -hmm. When I got to MTV, short story was, when I got to MTV and my mom, somehow, you have to imagine, I was like an executive for the first time in a big skyscraper in New York at the headquarters mm -hmm. of Viacom. That's pre-internet. Right. A guy with a mailroom cart was going around floor to floor, right. delivers a card to me the first day at work, and I opened it and it was from my mom. I couldn't believe that she found a way from Reno, Nevada, where she lived, to get a card to there get on that letter. day and coordinate it. <laughs> yeah. He delivered the card, and I opened it up, and it said, we're very proud of you. You now have a position of extreme influence. Use it wisely. Yep. And it was incredible. It still makes me so yeah. emotional today. That's you know? great. Yeah. So, that's great. so, I mean, I, don't, I hope enough people do that when they're in Good. a position like that. Well, I'm glad you are. Having such an experienced media executive on the stage with so many unique insights, I would like to know from you, how can the media and music industry make sure that artists are paid in the way that they deserve? You see, the problem often occurs on these kind of platforms like Spotify. Yeah. I don't know about you, but with the new platforms, we are listening to so much music everywhere, yeah. but still the artists yeah. seem to not be paid in the way they should be. What do you think could be a solution to that issue? Well, I think that they are now that with scale, the streaming platforms, the long tail of that is providing so many streams. Last year was a historic year. This year will be right. much bigger. The music industry is recovering to a place where it was 20 years ago, and we'll go beyond that with the convenience of streaming. Artists are making real money. The Good. record companies are very successful, and it's helping artists to reach new audiences audiences in new ways with products like TikTok, you know, and of we course with it. touring and other things. So yeah. um, I think it's just getting greater exposure and they're getting their music out to many more people than they otherwise would have. So you would say that they should value the marketing value over sure. the direct uh, monetary benefit? Sure. But, you know, many artists are making a lot of money in yeah. streaming as well. Yeah. yeah. I think they want to do both. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, I think sure. so too. Great. So nice to My meet pleasure. you. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here. Thanks, Thanks for very much. Me. Andy, Andy Sean. Sean. Thanks, everybody.